Welcome to Mind Science TV. Here we are again, uh, and it's a, a beautiful day in Sydney. We're moving into wintry weather, as you can see. I'm a bit, bit rugged up now, and I have somebody uh, with me today uh, that I've really been wanting to have uh, join me for for quite a while because I think it's really important that Mind Science TV brings the international flavour. And what about my own nation? And Australia is an amazing nation, and this chap is a rather amazing chap. So let me just uh, start off by saying uh, hello, Duncan Williams. It is so wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Richard, and I really appreciate you asking me to talk about my culture today. I look forward to it. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to wax lyrical about you for a sec, as I do with everybody, and uh, uh, you just have to remain humble as best you can. Uh, <laughs> here we go. No, he's a really interesting fellow. Duncan has been involved in uh, raising the awareness of what Aboriginal culture is all about in the context of uh, Australian workplace particularly, and generally helping people understand how it is uh, that you need to be with an Aboriginal and also, I mean, he's been working with his own people as well. He's not just telling us what to do. Uh, now, he worked with the, the Queensland Government. He was consulting with them for you know, a good 10 or 15 years. Uh, that just sort of wound up a, a little while ago. He was uh, teaching a particular course which, which has stayed uh, in its particularness with, the, uh, uh, with the, the Queensland Government, and I'll, I won't pronounce it correctly, but I'll have a go, Mura Ama Wakana, uh, and Duncan may correct me in a minute. Excellent. But now he's uh, established Oh, I did well. This is good. See, uh, I, I, we should stop the interview now. The, the uh, uh, and now he has uh, his own uh, set up a business, which is really good. Uh, Aboriginal cultural awareness. Uh, you know, the name says everything. And uh, he talks to businesses. He talks to uh, employment uh, areas. He talks to anybody who has this interest in understanding the nature. Uh, of Aboriginal people. And uh, Duncan, I'm one of them. I'm very interested in understanding more about the nature of all peoples. And I certainly should be starting with the Aboriginal people. So welcome, hello, here you are. Uh, let's have a chat. Excellent. Now, the first thing that's really important uh, in, in Aboriginal, the, the Aboriginal culture is brought to, to the opening of any event in, in Australia. And uh, you know, this, is, this isn't just an Aboriginal thing, it's, it's in a lot of Indigenous cultures. But it's called Welcome to Country. And I spoke to you before about this, and I, I really think it's the most respectful thing is to ask you to, to give a welcome to country, because it's also a bit complicated, because we're in lots of countries. But uh, uh, if you would just open the event, uh, having been introduced, with uh, uh, a proper and respectful welcome to country. Um, um, just to explain to you, first off, I'm going to explain to you, welcome to my country. Um, in Australia, you've got to be aware that there's 700 or more different known Aboriginal language cultures uh, in Australia before colonisation started. Uh, but to welcome to my country, there's many Wala Walu Jimbis. Hello and welcome, friends. Uh, to the Yugamba language nation, and my particular homeland is Mununjali, playing so there's an area south of Brisbane, Queensland. So welcome. Fabulous. I I I love it. I had an extraordinary experience in Canada with uh, uh, the uh, Indigenous peoples of of the area in Victoria. I was over there doing a, a, a particular you know conference on uh, complementary health and a variety of things. And uh, the, the woman who was doing it was, she had been chosen uh, as a very young child to be a, a spiritual representative of, of the tribe. And she did this particular uh, ceremony and we were guests and, and allowed to participate in the experience, which, which I think is something just wonderful in, with Indigenous people all around the world. And she finished it and afterwards I was speaking to her and she said, that is the first time, and she was now in her 40s and she'd been a you know, a spiritual, uh, a spiritual importance since she was about 10 or 11. She said that is the first welcome to country that they have done. Extraordinary. Oh, very. Well, I find that fascinating um, in the sense of uh, our people have been caught, kept back for so long, and yet we've been uh, asked to do welcome to country for 
over about 10 or 15 years now. And um, it's just interesting that other nations are only just starting to move ahead now. And yet Australia, Aboriginal people feels that we're still kept back in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, there's, there's ups and downs. The, you know, the scale of where people are at in various places around the world. Some are up, some are down, some are recent, some are, are distant. But in this Welcome to Country, I think one of the things that's really, and I, I think it's got a lot to do with the mind and with the mindset and with the way the brain works, uh, is that certainly we, we, we respect the traditional owners, the traditional elders and, and the, the, the language of the area and so on and so forth. That, that's the people side of it and I think that's, that's very important. But the thing that I can relate to, because of course it's more difficult for me to relate to the, to the, the language or, or the, um, the people history, but I certainly can relate to the earth. That what we're saying is that this, this land you are standing on is something that we are a part of. I mean, there's a variety of things. Could you speak a little bit about the, the nature of, uh, of the cultural relationship to, to land, to, to country? Oh, that's easy uh, in the sense of Aboriginal people are, are not only just part of the land, we are the land. We're, we're from the land. The land that we walk on is our mother. She provides our food, our clothing, our nourishment, our security, uh, and all we have to do is respect and look after her and nurture her uh, for what she gives to us. Um, so when you look at the, the animals, the trees, the water, the wind, the air, everything, it's all of us, we're all part, we're brothers and sisters all together in one, one environment. It, I mean one of the lovely things in Aboriginal culture is, is the, uh, the, the, the what, what can I call it, the extended family. I mean you have your family, um, but everybody is called auntie and uncle um, if, they are, if they are part of your your connected group, you know whether whether they're a blood auntie or uncle. I mean, I know I have I have my auntie, I have auntie Mari, who who isn't of blood, uh, but it's a real it's a real thing. I mean, uh, Lorraine Peters, you know of, I'm sure, who does a lot. I mean, I call her Auntie Lorraine, and it's kind of like if I didn't call her that, it would be disrespectful. That I yes. just think that's wonderful. Yes, it is, uh, and that's what it comes down to. Uh, you don't have to be a blood relation. Uh, but in a sense, Aboriginal people are blood related through spirit uh, over yeah. right across Australia. But for you don't have to be blood relation. It's a mark of respect as soon as you uh, an elderly person in front of you uh, to call them uncle or auntie is a mark of respect straight away. Um, you have to look back from our traditional ways of life from that in the sense of once you were getting uh, you were born and you, you got taught everything uh, from your eldest person. So your elder in that traditional life was anyone older than you. So in the sense of when you're looking at 13, 14, 15, now it, one respected the next one up. So when you're respecting your eldest, you're respecting anyone older than you as you grew up because the eldest person had more knowledge uh, to secure and look after you by looking after the, the obligation of looking after the younger ones. Mm. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I just uh, a, a little bit flippant, but I remember George Burns and on his 99th birthday, the, the American comedian said, "I was always told to respect my elders, and now I don't respect anybody." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but look at the age of him when he said that. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's quite the spirit of what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, you did mention just a second ago about my extended family system. Uh, well, in my, when I said to you my Yugambeh language group, uh, Mananjali is just one clan. Uh, we've got seven clans in our Yugambeh language group, and that's my extended family. So in my extended family, we've got Wilbergen, Bulligan, Wandrabara, Kumbamere, Nugambeh, Boraba. Uh, I was my extent. There's other six clans that are my extended family. But it's, they're more than that in the sense of when you're raised, they're in my extended family in their own language group areas with their own land to respect, look after and survive them with their nourishment and what have you. Um, but they're my immediate family as well. Because when it comes to respecting elders and someone passes away, any member of that 
extend the family system past the way, we are obligated to show respect uh, to them by going to their funeral and what have you. Now, this has uh, implications today for someone working in a business, and it might sound silly, but some people might go to their boss uh, every week saying, my uncle died, my uncle died, my uncle died. Well, in an Aboriginal family, we've got more than one uncle because the employer uh, is questioning, um, didn't you say your uncle passed away last week? Uh, yeah, that was a different uncle. So it has implications uh, if they're not understanding our cultural ways. And how do you recommend, you know, what, what do you uh, say to, to the, uh, you know, the average sort of uh, Western type of employer to, to manage that, that situation? Um, that's where um, my program, uh, going into teaching about Aboriginal culture, um, to let them know how our family looks, how it operates, our uh, traditional obligations, but not only traditional, these are traditional values coming into contemporary life now. There, there's three types of Aboriginal people today in contemporary life that you have to be aware of. That is urban, rural and remote. And the more you remote you go, the more in sync they are with their traditions and their customs. Um, Colonisation is still impacting on them in a, in a small, uh, in a large way compared to what we've taken for granted. Um, how can I, to explain this for you, sorry, uh, is I'm an urban Aboriginal person now. Uh, my family in South East Corner of Queensland here were the first people to be colonised um, from the beginning you know, when colonisation started in prison. So I've been colonised, my family's been colonised and urbanised uh, for a lot longer time for when you look at progression of colonisation from the Brisbane southeast corner out through the rest of Queensland. So therefore you have to be, uh, the longer I've been urbanised, the shorter time they have. And they still haven't been urbanised as yet because you've got to look at that rural and remote. I mean, this isn't dissimilar to 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 any culture, really, in the sense of of things. I mean, there are um, uh, there are those who who are used to being in one particular area, and and those that are used to being, on, I suppose, in, in just the, the the average Caucasian culture in Australia. Uh, a city fellow is a lot different from a country fellow, and you know you can't treat him the same. And and this this idea, I mean, sometimes what I find is that. Um, uh, when people talk, particularly, you know, just without making too much of a thing of it, uh, you know, just within the framework of, of a certain amount of prejudice and, and misunderstanding, which leads to a sort of bigotry. There's, there's sort of a talk about Aboriginals like they're, they're just one mob, one, one homogeneous mob. And, uh, and the, the, I guess they just, you know, people sort of then pick on the worst examples and say, you know, they're all like that, which is, well, it's just stupid really, isn't it? It is. That's called stereotyping. And my biggest pet hate is, in the sense, is media uh, over the past on how they've stereotyped us. Um, it also comes down to, you're looking at the words of how certain words are used. Now, to give you two examples of that, you take the word Aboriginal. Now, in the dictionary, it means from the, the beginning of time, right from the beginning. So the Aboriginal is a native person of the country from there, a long period of time. And then the second word you look at is Indigenous. Now, when you look at the word Indigenous in the dictionary, it means originating in the world. So it's, you have to have a look at the word Indigenous for yourself. Are you born here in Australia? Uh, yes, I was, yeah, yeah. Well, therefore, you originated here, you're Indigenous to the country. Yeah. So, in the sense of how governments use the word in the media, and if not all people are on the same plane field of understanding at least words, uh, then we get the segregation sets in. And it comes down to ignorance of understanding that language. So, therefore, uh, I think I've done what those policies had in place and assimilated me. Uh, for me to understand European language. <laughs> right. And I think this is so important because from, from the, the mind point of view, uh, the, the way in which, you know, these things, the, the semantics, the, the way uh, words are defined, the, the, 
the, the dominant uh, meaning of things, actually alters the way that which neurons fire. And uh, uh, the old, when we talk about brain plasticity as, uh, you know, the fire it to wire it, that, that if you just keep repeating something and you keep uh, uh, working on it, that the, the more you do it, it's what calls long-term potentiation. Uh, over the long term, you potentiate. You give it a you give it an energy, and you give it a a, a reality. But that is, is there's no discernment in the neurons between what's what's a good thing to potentiate and what's not a good thing to potentiate, and uh, that becomes very difficult. You just say if if the media, particularly, if they're just constantly saying um, you know you know bloody uh, Aboriginal whatevers, you know this and that, yes. same thing as. I mean, it's, I'm just sort of trying, when I sort of say things, not the same thing, but just comparing it to, to we have a, a, a white perception of the Westie you know, in, in Sydney. You know, there's the, there's the northern suburbs. I mean, there, there was all big hoo-ha about the Prime Minister poo-pooing the northern suburbs, you know. Uh, and it just sets up all these mindsets, which then can alter people's behaviour. Uh, Very what, much. What What do you find with with your uh, with with your people that you know? How how are they negative? What are the, some of the negative effects? What are some of the positive effects that uh, cultural attitudes have for Aboriginal people? Well, I'll talk about the positive at this stage. Um, it's mm -hmm. sad that a lot of us are losing our traditional ways first, uh, in the sense of, uh, and, and you have to look at the urbanising, the rural, and the, the remote. Uh, looking at the traditional ways. So even though I'm an urban Aboriginal person, I still believe in traditional values. So therefore, holding protocols in place in the sense of, for me, going to another person's country, acknowledging the country, accepting their ways, those people's ways, how they do things, how they communicate, all those sorts of things. And then I, just because I'm an Aboriginal person doesn't mean that I'm accepted in every community. I've got to prove to them that I know my protocols, I know my law, uh, and my law is L O R E, not L A W. L A W is a yes, yes, L O R E. L O R E mm. is traditional. Mm. So there's two more words that we have to play on. But if you show a mark of respect and acknowledgement uh, to them, then you know you're not in your country, you're in their country. So it comes down to protocols and respect. Um, the positive sides of trying to hold on to traditional values is trying to keep our children in place to still be family orientated in a strong way. Now, we're losing this in the respect of these days you hear the comment from people saying um, the young people don't respect their elders anymore. Well, that's not just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, that's uh, right across the board, uh, the respect yes, yes. for elders. Um, the negative sides of things is when you look at uh, stereotyping, to, I'll just paint a picture here for you in the sense of um, Aboriginal people uh, all drink uh, and we don't. Uh, if you look at the government surveys and everything around Australia, you'll find there's a, a, a low percentage of Aboriginal people that actually drink alcohol uh, compared to the non-Indigenous people of um, alcohol drinking mm. in one hand. Now, the sad thing is, the media pick up on Aboriginal people in the past, uh, where they're out in the open, drinking and they're gathering together uh, because they're comfortable within, within their own race, their own cultural ways and traditional ways of being in a group, out in the open air, out in the park, and then we can call them parks. It was our land back then. So, compared to looking at us like that, and marginalising, saying all Aboriginal people drink in the parks and what have you, that's our natural way, being out in the open. As where for non-Aboriginal people and what have you, they go into establishments, into pubs, clubs and what have you, so you don't see them out in the open. And then you have to look at, uh, it wasn't that long ago that Aboriginal people uh, weren't allowed to go into these establishments. So out of the mindset, we still don't go there. Yes, I mean these. This balancing out the sense of the sense of things. I, I mean, I, one of the wonderful stories, you know, with alcohol. Um, when I'm trying to explain people the nature of alcohol, 
uh, there's uh, the story of the uh, elephants in in Africa and a, a tree called the marala or marilyn tree, depending on uh, you know, yes. which book you read. And this tree fruits uh, these big mangoey type of uh, fruits, and they they uh, uh, sort of uh, ferment on, on the tree, and they start uh, emitting ethanol. And the elephants can smell this 20 miles away. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're keen, keen little buggers. Yes. And, <laughs> and so they wander over. They find the tree. Uh, also baboons quite like it, but also elephants and giraffes and, <clears throat> you know, the, the variety. But anyway, they find the tree. They all hang around. They, they, they eat the fruit and they knock it off the tree and they're doing things. And there's actually film on, on, on YouTube. You can, you can see it. And there's the elephants. Uh, they're drunk, drunk as skunks. And yeah. uh, but in not 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 uh, deathly drunk like uh, uh, overly drunk, but it, it, from a fermented fruit. And the baboons and all falling about and they're all doing this. You know, there you go. So it's in their genes. I mean, they are yeah. um, uh, inclined to do this. But then you just quickly uh, zip out of things, and then you bring human beings into the, the situation because uh, mm. the Maryland tree is very clever. It only fruits once a year, so. The elephants only get this experience, this fun experience of being drunk once a year. Humans come along and they just steal rice wine, and the elephants smell the ethanol, and you know it's the middle of winter, and they're going. It's a bit cold for fruit, but anyway, it's genetic. It's I don't know. Off I go. They stick their noses into <laughs> the, the the rice wine. They drink the rice wine. It's no longer just gently fermenting alcohol. It's you know refined alcohol. Uh, the elephants get drunk. Like a lot of people, when they get drunk, you know, society's maybe not that easy at elephants. They all get angry. They run around. They stomp on a few villages. Then someone gets out a gun and shoots them because yes. rogue elephant. Yes. But I sort of wonder how we can look ourselves in the face when not only do we not have leave the Maryland tree for once a year, but we have it on every street corner open 24 hours a day. Uh, and then you know, the mess that that creates. Well, duh, and the Aboriginal people are people, uh, and they're going to make as much of a mess as anybody else. Right. So, so when we, it's, it's, where, where do you go? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, please go on, don't it? No, I was just looking at the. You've got to look at the history in the sense of. Uh, I'm not saying that we didn't have any traditional uh, types of. Uh, uh, Alcohol or something like that, you know, in, in um, our religious ceremonial days and what have you. But I think it was the introduction of the rum and what have you uh, traded with Aboriginal people, which opened up a new door for them, for a new intoxicity, uh, which changed the way of their, their um, ways of thinking and what have you. And that's the important thing. It changes the way the brain processes information. Uh, and it isn't just people being incapable. It's it takes time, and it times takes time to break down uh, uh, these sorts of issues. And I mean, now we are seeing more uh, in relation to seeing just how long uh, and how persistent and how uh, uh, overbearing the dominance mm. that the, uh, the, the 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 white man brought to the Aboriginal people. You know. Almost, not quite from day one. It was, it was okay for a while, but it really yeah. just has been constant and persistent, hasn't it? All this time, and yeah. to some extent, it still exists. Very much so. Uh, sadly, uh, and that's why you've got to praise the elders in the remote communities here, wanting for them to be dry communities now, because the devastation has been for too long uh, on domestic violence and abuse and all these types of horrible things. And I support the elders as far as possible on what they're trying to achieve. But they don't, they just can't do it themselves. They need assistance uh, from the government and what have you into helping more resources in there to get people off of those addictions and what have you. There's just not enough mm. resources in a lot of these remote communities. And that's why they're labeled and stereotyped so much in the media uh, on these remote mm. communities. Um, it happens mm -hmm. everywhere, no matter what town you go to. Alcoholics, drug abuse, dr uh, alcohol, uh, uh, domestic violence, uh, all those types of things. They happen in every community. 
it's just sad that they've got to stereotype the Aboriginal communities uh, so much. Well, well, just flipping the coin to the other side a little bit in in the work that that you're really doing, which is uh, which is giving support uh, to the, the 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 many many Aboriginal people who are in the community working, uh, you know, seeking employment, enjoying employment, uh, contributing uh, to the to the community, but having a little bit of trouble. Uh, uh, sometimes with the uh, the lack of understanding from from the the boss to some extent. I mean, I, I, I said to you before when we were chatting before. I mean, we have Y Gen workshops and we have baby boomer workshops and we have uh, immigrant workshops. Uh, so it's it's a really normal uh, and useful thing. Uh, how, tell us a little bit about the the positive effects that 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 you find you have with these uh, wonderful workshops that you do in the employment area. Oh, over the years, um, it, it's wonderful to see the change of stolen generation for a start. Uh, in the sense of my first 10 years working in the Queensland Government was for child protection. And then finally yeah. seeing the, the legislation change for a stolen generation uh, within the Child Protection Act called the uh, Child Placement Principle, uh, specifically written in there for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children to make sure they keep their identity. So that is one breakthrough in the sense of stopping my stolen generation. I'm just going to have to jump in there because we're talking to people uh, in a variety of places around the world. They might not know what the stolen generation is. Could you just give us a little bit of a, a, a sort of a background as to what you mean when you talk about stolen generation? So we, 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 you know, some of our overseas people can get a grasp of it. It's a really important aspect of our of our culture. Excellent, yeah. Um, for there, I will promote the movie Rabbit Proof Fence for a start. Yes. So I'm sure yeah. people overseas to be able to get a copy of that and have a look at it. I'm so wrapped in that movie in, in the sense that it tells the truth uh, about our stolen generation. Now, uh, what it basically came down to was under the 1897 Protection of Aboriginals and the Restriction of Sales of Opium Act. Um, that they, are, they could remove children uh, uh, legally as such to uh, remove them to breed our culture out uh, was the process of it. But you have to look right back in the beginning in the sense of when Governor Arthur Phillips came to Australia in the Sydney Cove, rose, rose the um, Union Jack and called Australia Terra Nullius. Now, mm. understanding that Terra Nullius means empty void land, Therefore, we weren't even classed as people uh, right from the very beginning. And uh, it's interesting to say, um, and how a lot of people say, Duncan, you're too soft, how you carry on and what have you. Uh, being 11 years of age, uh, when I was accepted not only as an Australian citizen, but as a human being, uh, to be taken out of the floor and corn on the 27th of May 1967 which is in my lifetime. And this is the sad part, when people keep saying, Duncan, this happened 200 years ago. All I can do is say, no, it started then. Uh, we're still going through it. Um, the, the apology for, for Kevin Rudd, when the apologies, what a great leap forward. Um, not only saying sorry to the stolen generation for those children being stolen and given to other families to be raised as Europeans and that. And then that only went on the colour of your skin. Uh, if you were light enough colour, uh, you might have been raised as a European, but the darker your skin, you'd have to be a domestic or uh, used to all different forms of way of labour uh, from there. And those reformers skills that we came under, uh, the reformers skills to hire you out uh, from the school to work for someone uh, for the money to go back to the schools in my home. So stolen generation is sadly, still a number one issue for a lot of Aboriginal people still trying to find them, their sons, their daughters, their children, and vice versa, children trying to find their parents, where they're from, who they're connected to, they've lost their identity. Therefore, you link that to depression, and then you have a look at the drugs and the alcohol problems within the Aboriginal society. Yes, I, th I think the, the, the other... Uh, uh 
they have a film, I just think, Oranges and Sh Sunshine, which was talking about the way uh, some of our bureaucracy worked with the uh, uh, children from, from England. It shows that I think that the, the, the problem goes deeper into the, the Western type of culture, or I'm not quite sure which, type, which part of the culture that, to describe it, but it's just that there are some people who are of value and there are others who are not. And this decision is made you know, externally, you know, somebody decides. And certainly in, in, in our culture, uh, we still got it. Uh, different types of immigrants are considered to be um, unpleasant, un, unworthy, uh, uh, devalued, unvalued, and we can we can lock them away in prisons forever. So this, it's although the stolen generation uh, is is a terrible uh, and and you know you know a real blight on our on our culture. It's an aspect of thinking. It's a, it's a mindset that still pervades uh, the the dominance of the. Of the of the dominant culture, which happens to be white, but it's just the dominant culture because you know there, there's the histories of this in Africa in African tribes as well. It's interesting that yeah. we can do this. Sorry, I missed that question. No, I was just saying it's interesting that, that human beings can do this. Uh, how do you do? You, it, it's harder, really. It seems to be in the Aboriginal culture because of the nature of connection to land and connection to others to devalue. Other people uh, as readily. I, I'm not sure. What, what what do you think about that? I find it very sad, um, in the sense of, well, oh, that's what they did to us um, here, um, but they were doing it to their own people. But that was the expectation of their society um, to look at the Bernardo children uh, back in those early days, where those children were brought from England and fostered here in Australia and what have you, and told. That, the similar types of stories to to them about their parents and all these sorts of things. That's a sad situation. Um, but the trouble is for Aboriginal uh, people for the stolen generation and the difference, but there's, there's a similarity, but there's a difference in the sense of the the European culture there. Back in those days, it was very frowned upon and what have you for a uh, single mother, you know, women to have children without, you know, being married and all that. So, they they are raised in an expectation of you have a child that child will be adopted out uh, under those expectations. But Aboriginal people didn't have any expectations whatsoever just because uh, because Aboriginal communities was a community. So if you were a woman in in a clan group or a tribe, depending on what name you want to use, but it means the same thing, family group. Um, it was a whole community was a family, um, but there was no expectation. The it was an obligation of the community to raise the child. So the child in traditional life was not only raised by mum and dad, there was, in a sense, you look at it, there was, the mindset was there was no mum and dad. The whole clan group was the family. So you are raised by the whole clan or the whole tribe. Uh, so different expectations. Um, and then within Aboriginal society, uh, if a parent dies, the child automatically is raised to look after by the rest, rest of the family um, with no expectations. It's an obligation. Yes, and, and it was just sort of uh, no, no question. These, these, these things of just embedded and imbued history. There's, there's a wonderful story that I like to tell of a, um, of a Westerner uh, over in the Middle East and talking to a, a, a chap. Uh, and Curious. I mean, interested. You know, sort of heartfelt, interested about uh, being him being a Muslim because of all the worries. He was an American um, person, and the, and the American sort of said, "So, I'd like to understand a little bit more about why you're a Muslim. You know, why why you've chosen to be Muslim." And the chap said, um, I, "I, I, I'm a Muslim," and and the, the the American, of course, who comes from this this world of where, you know, there's no history, there's no culture, that you, you just develop it as you go, I mean, which is okay in some respects, but has problems in others. said, yeah. said but, but I just want to know why you chose being a Muslim. He said, I didn't. My father's a Muslim. My, his father's a Muslim, and his father was a Muslim. We've been Muslims for 2,000 years. And, and it's just this, this 
it's very difficult in this Western culture of uh, uh, change, change, change. Make it different, make it different. Do it, uh, you know, when we're talking about, about country before, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there imagining a, a, a stockbroker on the, the, the 75th floor pushing around uh, oil future shares. I mean, there he was actually making his living out of the earth, out of the ground. Yet, how, dis you know, how disconnected can you get? Yeah, exactly. It, it's amazing that, uh, and yet, you have a look at the history of the European life, and you just have to look at um, uh, the history itself of uh, Rome going into Egypt and then Egypt and uh, spread out so um, their cultures and what have you. So you have to have a look at the, what we call the European culture. Uh, you've got to look at their history. So they've been doing for thousands and thousands of years themselves of taking over, taking over, taking over. Um, looking at the uh, days of the Vikings going to England, then uh, Oliver Cromwell and the Roundheads, and uh, all those sorts of things of that history, it's been impact after impact after impact. Uh, for traditional native people to a country, um, they've gone to live with the land, with the environment, uh, and not expecting someone else to come in and change their ways. Uh, mm. You have to look at the different types of Aboriginal people in the sense of traditional life. Uh, you've got Aboriginal people in the northern hemisphere of Australia, in the Gulf areas, Darwin, all those sorts of things. And in their storytelling, talking about interactions with the, the moccasins, uh, the Indonesians, the Asians, and whatever, for trade and barking for thousands of years. And yet the southern half, of Australia, the bottom half, haven't had that much interaction compared to the northern. So therefore, in, in a country, one country there, you've got two different living styles because you've got interaction with outsiders, and on the other side, there's no interaction with outsiders. Mm. So when Europeans came into the southern regions to colonise, uh, we thought there were spirits coming back from the dead and, and trying to accept them as such, and therefore felt the um, sting of the fire stick. Uh, as to call it, uh, which wasn't anything against uh, spears against guns, uh, just doesn't compute. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. I, I hadn't thought about that. Of course, of course. And, there's, uh, and when you look back through uh, history and you look at the different type of, uh, there's just something I was looking at uh, a little bit recently, uh, the nature of the land, whether you're in, in, in hilly, isolated, difficult sort of territory or whether you're in large, flat plains where uh, cropping is, is easier to do, really has determined over the centuries uh, all kinds of personality aspects. You know, those in the sort of the, the, the hilly difficult areas like Greece were very independent and, uh, uh, and, and small group, but those that were in the, the larger areas uh, where they need to grow, cooperate to grow in China and various other places uh, were more group oriented. Uh, and it's just, it's just fascinating, and here's this other thing that, that, that the, the the more northern Aboriginals had this sense of others, but the southern ones, it was just like, well, as you say, you know, spirits coming out of heaven, you know, wow, yeah, yeah freaky. Uh, on, on sailing structures. <laughs> on sailing structures, yeah. And what the hell were they? Yeah. Yes, uh, exactly. So I, I like to. Um, I've always tried to be. Um, both sided, if you know what I mean. Like I'm an Aboriginal person, I advertise that. I'm quite proud of the fact that I'm an Aboriginal people person with a Scottish descent. Um, so to to understand um, where I'm coming from and being when I do my cultural wellness training, I am very upfront to people and saying, I'm here to train, not to blame. What has happened in the past has happened. There's nothing we can do about that now. But we can acknowledge history so we don't return to that. So therefore, what I like to put across for you today is an education. So, in, so we can all be on the same playing field. Now, I'll be um, until this actual Australian history is in curriculum correctly, uh, it's going to take a long time for people to be on the same playing field. Yes, and I think I mean that's difficult because well, the fact that it's not in there as as openly, and when it is discussed openly, it's still something that we find needs defending or needs something. 
Um, yes. And I think that a, a really good comment when when Barack Obama was was elected, uh, 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 an African American elder was sort of, uh, so, you know, someone said, "Oh, isn't it remarkable that that um, Barack Obama has been elected?" And he very wisely turned and said, "No, what will be remarkable is when it's not remarkable." And uh, I and I think the 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 truth of our history is still something that's that stings. Uh, we, we're not really mature enough yet to go. Gee, that was that was we stuffed up there, didn't we? <laughs> what can <laughs> yeah. we do to fix that? <laughs> exactly. And, and I think a, a lot of it is is history. People need to understand the history that people's coming from, um, because it's that people say understand history and hopefully it won't repeat itself. But you've got to understand history so you don't repeat it. Um, but the sad thing is. The world wide has history has repeated itself over and over and over again. The the only difference is time period. For well, Australia is the youngest country in the world to be colonised compared mm -hmm. to the rest of the world. So therefore, we are still young. We can still learn a lot quicker. Um, I look at the indigenous people from overseas in other countries. And the other country in the world that call their nations Aborigines and what have you is Canada. Um, therefore, yes. there's this, they're fighting the struggle that we're fighting. But how lot longer have they been going at it for? And look how much they've advanced to what we've gained. Like we still got a lot to gain. Don't get me wrong. But we have we're nearly sort of parallel in what we've gained to what they've gained over there. When you look at native title, land rights. All these uh, different uh, legal substances that you need to look at. Um, so therefore, we're the youngest country compared to the rest of the world, and yet uh, we're. I feel as though we're slowly moving forward, but we just move a little bit quicker for our younger generation coming up behind us. So what what do you see? Maybe uh, you know we, we've been going for a little while. Hmm, wow, that's fascinating. Uh, <laughs> what what do you what do you envision uh, uh, now? As you say, the, so there's the younger generation. They're coming up. Uh, there, there, there's still wounds all over the place. Uh, yeah. Some that we're, we're we're bearing and dealing with, and some that we're still hiding. Uh, what's your vision for the next while? I don't know. You can you can nominate how long. Uh, how do you see us going, and, and and what do you think you know we should do? I feel as though that we're we're moving together positively. It's just different areas and sectors that have um, um, I don't know the word to use. Um, it's not moving fast enough uh, in certain mm -hmm. ways. Um, until we get this education out there, so that we're all on the same playing field, um, that people will respect. Now, the, at the end of the day, the only way we're going to get respect. Is if they're willing to sit down around the table, I mean, not just Aboriginal people and non Aboriginal, I mean, all cultures. We've got to be able to sit down around the table and respectfully learn off of each other. Now, you can respect someone without dictating to them, you can respect someone without you know, assimilating them. You can, you can, you have a look at a workforce. Now, I was up in the mining site last week in central Queensland. And the different cultures there are working together, uh, and they do it in such a way that, all right, I'll respect what you say, I respect what you say, but at the end of the day, what it comes down for in that type of work is teamwork to be, to be safe, not only in the workplace health and safety sides of things, but culturally safe and respected. So therefore, if my mum loved my father for who he was, and he loved her for who she was, then what right have I got to force other people's thinking down their throat? Just respect. Yes, and it's res we need to learn, not talk at each other, and Correct. not even uh, certainly to talk to, but learning. I think you're so right that, that education is always the answer to everything, and. If somebody says, I mean, I, I, I know, a, I hear people say, oh, I don't know why you did that. I so, and they're sort of saying it in that rhetoric sort of thing of, I don't know why you did that and you shouldn't have because I wouldn't have. 
actually, that problem is a message. I don't know why he did that. Well, here's your opportunity. Go out and find out. And uh, now I hope some people who've listened to this talk today have got a, a, a bit of an insight into the the ebb and flow. I mean, we, we, we've talked about some positive things, but it, it's inevitable that it, the conversation will roam around some of these difficulties that, 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 have, uh, that are still there, because they are still there, and it is still difficult. Yes. Um, it, it's, it's difficult to be a human being on this planet, uh, <laughs> but it's even more difficult to be one that is, comes from a history of being owned or managed or dominated. It's, it's very hard for the those that literally haven't had to deal with this to, to, to understand, but little bit by little bit, and hopefully this conversation we want to So I, I can't thank you enough for, for, for sharing all that, that wisdom and experience and knowledge. Thank you very much, Richard. And just to finish off with, um, in the sense of when it comes down to respect, we've got to get around being scared to ask. It's not about what you're asking the person, it comes down to how you ask them. Yeah, Sandy Lorraine said a lot about that. Said, just ask, you know, maybe they'll have a bit of a bark at first, but calm down, Aboriginal people mostly are interested. Uh, but ask, what a, what, a, what a great thing. So, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I hope you've, you've enjoyed that. And what a, what a fabulous uh, tone and note to leave it on. If you don't know something, ask. But it's a matter of learning and understanding how to ask with respect and to ask with a sense of heart. And uh, I think pretty much everyone all around the world understands when things are coming from the right place. So um, uh, it, you know, it leads beautifully into you know, my sense of curiosity is the thing that will save this world. Uh, and uh, anyway, to you, Duncan, we just everybody, I'm sure, says thank you very much. And, and we just wish you well in the endeavours to continue to educate and calm and integrate, and from the interpersonal neurobiology point of view, to integrate minds into something, not who wins, but what new can we create? That's what's exciting for me. Thank you very, very much, Richard, for, my, for the opportunity for me to share um, at some time. Uh, if I can meet the people that are looking at this and listening to this and what have you, um, face to face is a better value and uh, you get uh, actual physical feeling then. And uh, I want to wish you all the very best in the future and a safe journey with your spirits. That's wonderful. Thank you, Duncan. Bye-bye, everybody. See you next time.